Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, d uh, dealing with the uh, technical challenge here. You think we could launch rockets to Pluto and we can't get microphones to work. Uh, I'm a geologist by training, and I've been working with satellite data for over 40 years now. So um, what I wanted to do is show you some images that particularly strike my fancy. But uh, th the reason is that the vantage point from space is unique. When we first started with the Landsat images, the MSS scanner in 1972, it was the first time we'd were been able to get higher than a few thousand feet from an aircraft to look at the Earth. But not only that, we started getting the technology to be able to um, look at features on the Earth in wavelength regions our eyes were not sensitive to. So this gives us even more information. So I think what I have spooled up here are just some images that strike my fancy. Um, do you do it? Uh, no. Go ahead. Well, it's two things to, to deal with. I'm, I'm always fascinated by patterns, and I don't know why. It's something to do with my hard wiring. So uh, a, a while ago, I decided to look at agricultural patterns. And each of these uh, uh, nine uh, clipouts from uh, various uh, data sets is the same scale. So what it, what it tells you is that the human impact on the land certainly varies from country to country, but in many cases, it, it's imprinted from a very, very long time ago. So you, you probably recognize some of these, or at least you'll know in general where they are. The upper left is in the, the US with the, uh, the meets and bounds system that was laid out in the 19th century. Basically a one mile grid very regular, the nice dirt roads that, that move along. Um, the next image is in China. And to me, this looks like planned development. Notice the even spacing of the cities and how very small the individual plots are. I mean, compare that with, with over here. In the upper right, north of Bangkok, rice paddies. Uh, again, very small plots, but extremely long and linear. I'm not sure what, what the origin of that is. Here's our familiar center pivot irrigation system, which is now, uh, you can find examples of this worldwide. It's not just in the US. So it, uh, generally there's, a, there's a, a well at the center of these and it punctures down into a, an aquifer. And then there's a pipe that comes out here that's on wheels that moves around and it's called center pivot for that, that reason. It's not very efficient because you lose a lot of the land, so, but it was developed. Here's in, in Brazil, where mostly they do ranching, and the size of the plots of land here are just enormous. I mean, compare that with, with this. On the right, I think I'll show that one again, is in, in Bolivia, where the government has planned uh, development in the Amazon. So they established the, the grid pattern of roads, they established a village at each of the centers, and then provided land in these pie-shaped forms. And eventually these settlements coalesced so that all the rainforest was gone in this part of the world. Uh, this is in central Germany, and the real hodgepodge arrangement of the fields dates back to medieval times. So the land boundaries have not changed in 500 years, maybe 1,000 years. An area in, in um, Australia I like because of the sand dunes and they still try to farm here. And this was a, a particularly striking area in uh, eastern Washington called the Palouse region that just had nice patterns again. Okay. Spent a lot of time. Where are we going next? We're going nowhere. Oh, the McDonald Range in Australia. So as a geologist, images like this um, always tell me a lot. We can't get this kind of information on the ground. If you sent a geologist out here in the old days, you'd drive for certain distances. Mostly you'd have to walk. You could visit a few places. You'd sit on top of one of these low hills. You'd squint. You'd hope you got it right. Um, for a base map, maybe you used a really poor topographic map and tried to draw the boundaries of the units. Or maybe you had a crappy black and white air photo. This is what I grew up with as an undergraduate. We didn't have data like this. So very simply, I mean, the, the colors here represent mineralogical differences for the different rock units. And if we have enough uh, wavelength bands, like with a hyperspectral scanner, 
we can actually extract the mineralogy and determine what the rock type is. In a case like this with something like Landsat, we can pretty much tell that these are different units, but we can't really identify the mineralogy very exactly. But what you can see quite obviously is that you have a layer cake of, of rock units. Clearly they've been uplifted so that they're not horizontal anymore, they're slightly, slightly on edge. Also they've been gently folded, you can see that here. There's some kind of fault going on over here because the section gets repeated and overturned. So the tremendous information just from simple photo interpretation. And it's, it's just a lovely part of the world. From the ground, it probably really sucks. I mean, it's dry, it's dry, it's flat, you know, there's not much going on there. But from the air, it's really gorgeous from the space. Okay. Oh. So this is the area in, in, um, uh, in Bolivia that uh, I was talking about. So here's, here's the, uh, almost the pristine rainforest. They established the first villages. The uh, plots get larger and larger, larger and larger. And by 2013, the rainforest is gone. Well, there's a tremendous population pressure in the cities. There's a lot of land that can be used for farming. So the government has to make a decision on the trade-off. Do you preserve the rainforest and do you keep people in poverty? How do you get them to feed themselves? How do you feed them? Or do you provide opportunities? I mean, it's a dilemma and I don't, there's no good answer. Next, where are we going? Hello, draw it over the southwestern U.S. Well, one of the obvious things we can do is to, to monitor water levels in reservoirs, for instance. And this is near my part of the world, Lake Mead, just east of Las Vegas. Uh, Lake Mead supplies water to a large part of the southwestern U.S. It's the, uh, a dam, one of the dams on the Colorado River. So in June 2000, the lake was at one of its highest levels, the reservoir. And by 2015, it was down to about 30% of the volume that it normally stores. Fortunately, we had a really good winter last winter, which replenished the, uh, the water, the snowpack for the areas way upstream that feed the Colorado River, and also the Sierra Nevada mountains in Northern California that provides the water when I turn on my tap in Los Angeles. So this is a real good application for um, satellite data, and you don't need very sophisticated data. Uh, yeah, you've all heard about the fires burning in my part of the world right now. The Thomas Fire has burned something like 250,000 acres. This was a big fire which was just east of downtown Los Angeles, the Grand Prix Fire. Um, with thermal infrared bands and other channels, we can provide a lot of information to firefighters. So the, the green is vegetation. Portrayed in the dark red are areas that have already burned. And because of the presence of the thermal infrared, we can see the active fires burning right here in, in bright red. So the, the combined information from different wavelength regions can provide valuable information if we can get it to the first responders in time. And that's almost always the problem, is uh, NASA not being an operational agency getting data to the people who need it in time is sometimes very difficult. Okay, I think we're on the home stretch. Just an image I like. The, the Great Barrier Reef provides an endless opportunity for pretty images. Uh, but not only that, the data are clearly useful for monitoring the coral reefs. You obviously cannot send boats out and monitor tens of thousands of these small coral reefs. But satellite data is perfect for doing this kind of monitoring. You can use the data then to, to classify the image, to determine where's the live coral, what's uh, located inside the lagoons, how much seagrass there is, how much sand, and look for change over time. So bleaching of the corals shows up very nicely in these kinds of data. And there, there's been a project that's gone on for about 10 years that is looking uh, at monitoring coral reefs globally using mostly Landsat data. This would have been impossible 20 or 30 years ago because we just didn't have the technology or the data to do this kind of work. Every image is a surprise. Oh, the growth of cities. 
An obvious thing you can do from satellites, you don't need very high resolution data to do this. This is a time sequence of uh, Las Vegas. Our first Landsat data was in 1972. So we have an image here from 1975. You can tell that our original resolution was not so good. This is the first instrument. The multispectral scanner had about 80 meter spatial resolution at best. But nevertheless, you can see what Las Vegas looked like in 1975. 91, it's starting to grow. It's growing, 2000, it's growing. In the period in the early 2000s, this was the fastest growing city in the United States. 2015, it has completely filled its valley. So to the west here, there's a mountain range. To the east, there's mountains. To the north, there's mountains. To the south, there's hills. Las Vegas has essentially filled its bowl. It's spilling out to the east in, in satellite cities like Henderson. One of the big problems for a city like Las Vegas is where does it get its water? Uh, like Phoenix, it mines its groundwater, which is a fossil reservoir that does not get replenished. So once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, fortunately, they've got Lake Mead just to the east of them, but there are 50,000 claims on the water of Lake Mead, of the Colorado River. So there's water wars, basically. So Las Vegas is still managing to... to uh, water its people. How long can that continue? I don't know. If there's more years of drought, what are they going to do? What are we going to do in Southern California? Are we done? One more. Oh, more pretty pictures. Uh, Australia is, is one of the nicest places to do remote sensing, particularly as a geologist, because maybe only about 5% of the country has vegetation. So everything is exposed. The continent is extremely old and it has not changed geologically for the most part, in some cases for several hundred million years. So things that occurred a long time ago look like they're fresh and they're well preserved. Um, here we're looking at this big circular structure. It turns out that this is a very large meteor crater impact, but it dates from about 250 million years ago. So if you're familiar with meteor crater in the southwestern US, it dates from maybe 50,000 years ago. This looks almost as fresh, and it's, it's several hundred million years old. We've used the data. People who are interested in, in cratering and meteors have been looking at uh, surveying the whole world to try to identify uh, craters. Mostly they get destroyed by erosion because the Earth is just a very, very dynamic place where things get resurfaced. The Australian continent's an exception, some parts of Africa, there's some very old craters. This is a really good example, though, of uh, how you can use the data just looking at circular structures. It doesn't take any big processing, doesn't take any sophisticated data. You look for circles. One more? One more. Is there one more? Oh, Lake Mac see Australia again. I, I don't know why. Australia always has great examples. This is one of the uh, uh, ephemeral lakes in Australia. You can see the, the water, where there is water, the dark blue and gray, is only a few meters deep at best, and it's ephemeral. Clearly, the landforms mostly seem to be dominated by sand dunes, so there's a very strong aeolian uh, component here, the linear dunes in the northeast. A, a lot of the information we could get about the mineralogy of this area, we could get with uh, some more sophisticated instruments than Landsat. But again, it's just an interesting abstract design. But again, it draws me these patterns that, that you see on the Earth's surface that you, you can see from the vantage point of space. Is that the last one? Okay, I'll be happy to answer any general questions or specific questions.